one more time. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love no longer has placed you high I am not a captive to you
and I will not be shaken. This time you can be seated. I have a Bible up here. Is it down there? Did someone walk off with my Bible. I, it was me. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you. Well, I had a moment of panic there. I don't know what I would have done. I guess read from the screen. Uh, my name's Tori Elliott Gingrich. Good morning once again, everybody. I'm one of the pastors here at Hillsdale Church. I have just a couple of announcements for us this morning. The first one is that today at 3 o'clock here in the sanctuary, we're having dessert with the pastor, which is a time where we get together. Um, Y'all have the opportunity to ask questions questions and to eat cake. So what more could you really ask for? Um, this event or this uh, time together is really geared towards those of you who have not joined the church, who might be interested in joining the church, those who have just been visiting, those who have questions about what the heartbeat of Hillsdale is. We are a United Methodist Church, so we go over that a little bit, but we also get to know one another and talk about the mission that we have here. So we would love for you to join us. Um, that's today at 3 p.m. in the sanctuary. You can just come on by, bring an appetite for some pound cake. Um, a second announcement is that our registration is now on our website for the Professor Retreat, which is um, a weekend-long event where we, the church, take a group of uh, teenagers, elementary school kids, and they get to learn about what it means to profess your faith. We talk about baptism, we talk about the Trinity, we talk about the Apostles' Creed, and then they get to ask all of their questions. So it's a really fun weekend. It's completely funded by the church. If you have a young person in mind, please feel free to sign them up on the website. If you have someone in mind and you're not entirely sure if they're the appropriate age, um, Come and talk to me afterwards. Catch Pastor Jerry afterwards. Um, we have taken all uh, an, uh, an entire array of, age, of ages with us, and we just want to be able to pour into um, the young people here at the church. So sign your kids up for that professor treat on our website. At this time, we're going to be reading our scripture for this morning. Um, which is in Psalms chapter 19. You can flip there with me if you'd like. We are going to be reading starting on verse 7 to, through the end of that chapter. If you don't have your Bibles with you, you can read along on the screen. So, Psalm chapter 19, verse 7. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true, each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord my rock, and my redeemer. At this time, we're going to go into a time of prayer. And I want us, I will be leading the prayer, but collectively, I'd like for us to lift up the families of those who lost loved ones in Afghanistan this week, both our own troops and those who are 
the Afghanistan people. Um, it is such a heavy, heavy time that we're living in. We spoke about that a little bit last week as well. And it is of so much importance that we um, don't abandon hope, that we continue to pray because that's what Christ has called us to do. So we're going to lift those um, who are mourning and those who are living in uncertain times up in prayer. And we're also going to pray for those who have already been affected by um, the hurricanes and, and the storms that are coming. I have friends whose family have been already evacuated. So we're going to lift those up, those people up in prayer together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you <clears throat> that in the midst of chaos, in the midst of darkness, that you reign over it all. That your words still ring true for us today. That in the midst of, of times that feel like there is no light at the end of the tunnel, that you are still the light. We pray for those who are mourning, for those who are living in fear. We lift them up to you, Father, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would come and bring comfort like only you can do. That your name would be made known in every situation, in every heart, and that the testimony of your redeeming grace would triumph. We pray for those who are experiencing the fear of destruction of their homes, that sense of being out of control with the storms that are on their way. And we ask once again that your peace that passes all understanding would reign true, that your name would be made known as sovereign and holy. And that what the enemy set out for, as, uh, to, for destruction, to steal and to kill and to destroy, that you would flip it on its head, that this would be a testimony of your goodness, a testimony of your faithfulness to be with us at all times, in all situations. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, Tori. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Hillsdale. We're glad you're here to worship with us this morning as we come together as the body of Christ. You know, um, Tori and I always touch base before the service. And we talk a little bit about uh, announcements and uh, prayers that we want to lift up and things that we want to say. Uh, and we always um, think in terms of not overwhelming you with, with things, um, giving too many announcements or too many um, prayers to be uh, thinking of. But today we come together and boy, it's just like uh, we could just keep on with the prayer concerns and the things that are happening in our world and the things that are going on around us. I mean, we were just talking last week about uh, the earthquakes in Haiti, and this week we're talking about soldiers that we've lost and, and the fear and uncertainty of Afghanistan continuing and, and, and the hurricanes again. Today's the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, and we went down and worked after Hurricane Katrina uh, several years ago, and the devastation that occurred all along the Gulf Coast looks like it's happening right now as we speak again. And so we're, we're just kind of inundated with, with prayer concerns, aren't we? And, and those are just kind of the big items. It, there's all kind of things that happen in and around us, in our community, um, the pandemic, you know, all the things that are happening locally to us that just shake us to our core, and so we could spend, certainly, uh, this whole time together in prayer, and that wouldn't be a bad idea. 
um, because of the, the magnitude of what's going on. But I wanted to um, start today uh, and to share with you a new sermon series uh, that Tori and I will be leading us through for the next month. And this is something I, I can honestly say, I, I ask God to lead, I ask God to give me uh, direction, and often we will put uh, these kind of themes together and then uh, Tori and I will be praying about them well in advance. This, this particular set of um, sermons that we're going to share over the next month, I don't believe there's ever been a time in my life as your pastor, and it's almost 20 years now, that I have felt so strongly convicted and um, guided by the Holy Spirit and by our God to share this message with you, the church. It's, it's an important message. It's one that uh, we hear over and over and over again as Christian people, as people of faith and community together. And, and I just feel an incredible conviction uh, to lead and guide us through this as your shepherd, as one who speaks to you about spiritual life. This series is called Pushing Reset. This morning, in our first service, we had a hiccup with our technology. Uh, I think it was something with Noah's guitar cord. But for those of us in the room who were over 50, we panicked. We thought, oh my goodness, we're not going to be able to have worship today. We're going to shut down. So that was my inclination. The minute I heard it, well, it's over. That's it. But if you were under 50, uh, oh, oh, well, we'll keep going, keep going. And Ethan even said, yep, keep going. And, and so there, thank goodness we have all of this youthful presence in our worship team, and they just pushed right through it. But for me, my fear was we're going to have to find the reset button and push it because something is bad wrong, and it was just a guitar chord. Um, pushing reset uh, for us in this sermon series over the next few weeks is about spiritual life. The spiritual life, our spiritual life as believers, as those who profess in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our spiritual life sets the agenda for all of life, for our entire life, for everything that happens and goes on in life, in your life, the spiritual life as a believer as a Christian, sets that agenda. And every once in a while, certain things within our spiritual life can get out of alignment. They just do. Life continues to come at us. Uh, we're living on this side of heaven, not in that perfect place in paradise yet. Uh, we are promised that, but we're not there yet. And so, as we're, as Paul would say, as we're in this world and not of it, we experience temptations. Sometimes we give in to temptation and we really get out of line. Then we stumble and fall and, and kind of hit a wall, so to speak. Well, that's what God has kind of put on my heart lately. And I really want us to, to speak to that. A few weeks ago, one of our life leaders came to me and said, Pastor, said, what in the world is going on in our world? Said, um, she said, I know you don't do Facebook, and I, I don't do Facebook. So if you're talking to me over Facebook and I'm not responding, please don't be offended. Um, I don't do Facebook, uh, and I have my reasons for that. But um, this person, this life group leader said, I can't believe what's going on on Facebook and what people are saying to each other and how unruly it is and how mean-spirited and how unfiltered and it's just nasty pastor and not only that it's church people and so you know I thought to myself um, wow we are out of alignment if that's us listen when you think about all that's going on in our world when you think about earthquakes in Haiti when you're thinking about 
uh, military action in Afghanistan, when you think about hurricanes hitting the Gulf Coast, when you think about pandemics, the church needs to react as the church. We need to be aligned in our spiritual life so that as the psalmist wrote, as Tori just, the law of the Lord is perfect. Our testimony is pure. It is sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb. And may the words of our mouth. You've probably heard that more than anything else you've ever heard in this church, scripture-wise. More so than our mission statement or anything else, because typically I say that at the end of my prayer, beginning, it's kind of a call to worship for me. May the words of my mouth, your pastor, and the meditations of our congregation's hearts together be acceptable to you, O oh God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. But it wasn't written for me as your pastor. It was written for all of us as God's people. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O oh God. Everything I say, everything I do, everything along my spiritual life be acceptable to you, O oh God. That's what the world needs to see in the midst of the chaos and the turmoil. This week I was trying to formulate my thoughts around, uh, you know, all the different things that are causing chaos in our world right now. And I, and I thought, you know, here's, here, as I was coming up with that list, it seemed like all the words started with the letter P. Now, I don't know why that is. I, there's a few words that don't. But they, they seem to fold into that, um, in, into that general thing, pride. And, and I think pride, as creating chaos in our world, could probably be the heading for all the other words. Pride might be the category that we are ensnared in in our culture. Pride is that, that umbrella word. But underneath there, uh, you, you have other P words. Prejudice, pandemic, polarizing, politics. There's all kinds of words that fit within that that quite honestly I believe are causing chaos within our world and and the way we're reacting to it causes chaos. And it is causing us, my fear is, as the church, to get out of alignment. So, as I said, spiritual life, spiritual life sets the agenda for all of our lives. And it needs to be in alignment. Today I want to talk about one particular area of a Christian's life that is so important. And it kind of goes along with what that uh, life group leader was telling me. This, this kind of unfiltered approach that we have of saying anything we want to say anytime we want to say it to anybody. Um, Self-discipline and self-control are not optional in a Christian's life. When you read your Bible, front to back, when you look at the Old Testament, and especially when you look at the New Testament, you hear the words of Christ Jesus, you hear the words of Paul and Peter and James and John and all of our uh, church fathers who, who wrote most of the New Testament for us. Self-discipline. As a Christian, self-control as a person of faith is not an option. It is something that we are required to do. L listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. He really fusses at us in 1 Corinthians. But, he, you know, we just finished the Olympics. And in the Olympics, I, you know, I'm always moved by the Olympians, the young people who 
work and train and discipline themselves so much for that gold medal. They're going for the gold, and, and we're all encouraged. And we even had some local guys here to, to win gold in, in racing. And so Paul uses this analogy of a race when he's talking about our spiritual life. He says this, Don't you realize that in every race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win, Paul says. Run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize. But their prize will fade away. But we run to win because we're doing it for an eternal prize. Our prize is different from the world's prize. We are set apart from the world. We are aliens in this world. So, Paul says, I run with purpose in every step I take. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Self-discipline and self-control, we hear over and over again, is not optional. Now, James tells us in, in his uh, short little letter, James, the brother of Jesus, he said, temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. I love that phrase. <laughs> I think that's where we get out of line, isn't it? We need to admit when we're out of line, don't we? When, when we find ourselves, when we find the words of our mouth, and we find the meditations of our hearts taking us someplace. Now, you know, I, I shared with you all those P's words. Not, not all of us are, are struggling in that arena. Um, some of us struggle in other arenas. I've shared this before with you. I don't do Facebook. I eat food. <laughs> and I eat way too much food. I have very little self While you're on Facebook, uh, social media, talking on Facebook, I'm fixing vanilla wafers with peanut butter in the kitchen <laughs> at 10 o'clock at night. I struggle with eating. I, and and that's, that's, that's a, a discipline and a self-control that I know I admit. You know, several years ago, I shared with you, it still entices and drags me away. But I shared with you how much I love Krispy Kreme donuts. I love Krispy Kreme donuts so much that I used to, I have repented of this, but I used to drive up and down Stratford Road waiting for the hot now sign to come on. I would make excuses to hang around Stratford Road and wait for the hot now. And, and listen, I, I'm not proud of this. I can eat a whole dozen of those jokers. So we have to admit our problems, don't we? We have to admit what we struggle with and what we need to discipline our lives with and realign. I was telling Ethan this morning, um, Ethan's Tori's husband working in the sound booth, uh, and he loves hot dogs. And I read an article this week, I love hot dogs too, and he read, I read an article that every hot dog you eat takes 36 minutes off of your life. Ethan and I are in the hole. <laughs> We're going backwards. <laughs> I love to eat. I don't know if you caught it last week in Noah's sermon. Early in his message when he, was, he delivered a powerful message, I loved everything he said, but I almost shut down at the beginning, Kelsey, because you know what he said? He said that donuts in Chillicothe, Ohio are better than Krispy Kremes. <laughs> now, that caused me to pause. And, I, you know, I could react to that, couldn't I? I could say, okay, that's the last time Noah's going to get to preach. <laughs> Absolutely not. They even, uh, Tori said, they even call it Krispy Kreme with a C. With a C. See, they're even trying to take off on what is good and perfect. I struggle with food. 
I really do. I, I just, and, and that's been a lifelong struggle, and, I, and I, I have to work at it. I have to say to myself sometimes, you know, stop. Stop what you're doing. Quit doing that. Reset. And, and maybe we need to clarify the word for us in our uh, church vernacular is to repent of what you're doing wrong and realign yourself. Listen to what um, Paul says in his letter to the church in Ephesus in this regard. We have to stop living out of control and allowing just anything we want to say, anything we want to do. If it feels good, do it. That's what the world tells us. We have to stop doing that. Here's what he says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God. You, you have been created. You have been um, grafted into God's nature, which is righteous and holy. Stop telling lies, Paul says. Let us tell our neighbor the truth, for we're all part of the same body. Don't let sin control you by letting you be angry. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. You want to know where the biggest foothold is in our life? The interstate, the off-ramp, the on-ramp, the stoplights. Boy, I've never seen such anger. Have you? We are mad. I, I think maybe culture and people and the human condition, we react to chaos by just getting angry at everything and by throwing sticks and stones even at other believers. And we forget May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O oh God. Paul goes on to say, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful. How many of us can repent of this? How many of us can repent? Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, God has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of all rage. Get rid of all anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. We need realignment in the church. When we're at each other's throat, when we are becoming polarized in our own communities, think about the testimony. The psalmist said, the testimony of the Lord is perfect and pure and sweet, just like the honey flowing from the honeycomb. And yet... What the world sees is unfiltered, harsh, throwing things at one another. We have to resist. We have to push that reset button and say, God, I need some realignment here. I'm sorry, and I want to come back to the way that you would have me live my life. Now let, me, let me just close with, with one thought here. One of the things that Paul says as well, listen, this is, this is all over our scriptures. I, 
this is what we are called to be and to do. Paul says in Galatians 5, verse 16, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves, what your sinful nature entices and drags you into if you will first let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. I, I want to I wanna call your attention here to the sequence of what Paul is saying. So many times we think as human beings, I got to get right, then I can go back to church. I've got to do this on my own. I got to clean up my own act and then God will welcome me back. Pastor, I haven't been to church in a long time. You know, I want you to know why. My life is in chaos. My family, we're not speaking to each other. We're all believers, but we're on two different sides of culture. Politics. Pandemics. And we're, and we're just isolated and alone I'm going to get this fixed pastor and when I get this fixed I'm coming back to church I promise you that sequence is wrong you, you, you've interpreted something wrong what God is saying to you and to me in this alignment effort is that we need to depend on God that we need to listen to the Holy Spirit guidance then all of this alignment stuff is going to fall into its proper place don't leave don't check out don't say I, I can't do it it's beyond my ability God knows that listen things we're going through the world in the state that it's in right now is bad it is our time as Christian people to stand up and say, God is your rock and your redeemer. God has placed his Holy Spirit already in you. And we are to depend on that spirit for guidance. Now you can disagree with your pastor. But the Holy Spirit, if you will attend to it, if you will say to God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of the Spirit in my heart that you have given me. Will be pleasing to you, O oh God, in everything that I do. Then we will resist. We will find ourselves in a place of repentance. And that discipline and that self-control will fall into place the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together this morning, oh God, be acceptable to you. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our closing song?
sing this one more time as a church. of our lives from this day forward. And Lord, align us to your will, to your grace, what you would have us do as your people for a world that is lost and hurting. And all God's people said, Amen. Have a great week. See you next week.